it's part and parcel of life. You know, there's something vibrant about about people, about, I don't know, just the wonder of, you know, there's wonder in nature, but there's also wonder in urban environments as well. It was traumatising. I can't even explain to you how the pain felt. Like, even if you breathe, it hurts. They assess me and uh, they start counselling. I become to understand that there is a life. I'm not that well half the time. And actually, I've got this illness. It's probably going to get worse. It might get a bit messy and horrible. And that becomes part of who you think you are. And that's, you know, what, what makes you you. You just can't measure. You know, it affects everyone. You should do it. You, you be very determined to do it. You must have will power. Everyone else will say, are you OK? How are you? You know? And when you see people acting like that to you, it's like, I'm not dead yet. Okay. The family is gathering slowly. I got 10 grandchildren, so I think I'm lucky. My name is uh, Zahur, but uh, in my working life, I am known as Harry. Right, okay. First, I had the amputation of my fingers, and during the course of that treatment, uh, I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. During that period, uh, also I was diagnosed with my prostate and uh, uh, my uh, lung. I felt very depressed. Actually, on many occasions, I decided that I commit suicide. You better get a last look at that phone because it's getting confiscated. <laughs> I told you yesterday I was taking no, it. Can I have my headphones back? No. Hi. You're filming this whole thing. You're evil. <laughs> Hi. We'd like to see more of Shanae. She spends a lot of time in her room. Can I see your room? No. It was like, Shanae, let's clear out your wardrobe. She's like, no, I don't want to do it. I don't. She sat on the floor on her phone and let Jermaine clear out her wardrobe, like getting rid of clothes and everything. In the meantime, she could have tidied up her room. She sat there in the whole mess. in June of 2010. Oh, I was told that it was highly unlikely I was going to make it to five years. One, Jay. Like, why would you say something like that? I just can't believe that someone can actually put a, a figure on your life. I was four or five. She wanted us to feel happy and, like, she didn't want us to worry about her and all of that cancer. So we made up this book to let out our feelings if, if we want to put something down. I bought a really special book. I called it the Book of Feelings for our family. Look, I wrote something for you. Did you even read it? No. Did you, Corey? Corey's at this stage now where he's just petrified yeah. if yeah. anything's going to happen to me. I try and talk to him just to remind them that no one is going to be here forever. What did you write? And I drew a little picture there to show all of us. See, like, Corey always cries sometimes, and I just, like, stay out of it because I don't want to cry. But, but there's nothing wrong with crying. It's good to cry. My mum is brave, beautiful, moany sometimes, and you've tried to stay happy. Even though sometimes you have your moments when you go into your bedroom and cry. If you think I don't notice that, I do. Remember, remember, when your bedroom window is open, so is mine, so I hear everything. They wanted me to have my kidney, my bladder, my womb, my ovaries, and part of my bowel removed for the best chance of my survival. And I feel emotional. Um, I lost where I am. certain safety, I feel, being surrounded by people and movement and activity all the time. It feels like if, you know, as long as I'm up to doing something, I can do it. There's no kind of limitation because everything's just there.
I have so much to explain to people when I first meet them. Not when I first meet them, because that would be bizarre. <laughs> first date conversations, it's cancer's not the best one. Who are you using the sound on this, are you? Oh, you are. <gasps> it was a lot of treatment over a long period of time, but it worked the first time round and it never came back. And I've been in remission since I was 19. The fact I've had health problems since then has meant that my cancer experience has kind of been dragged out. And what I worry about now is that the illness will stop me living in the way I want to. As a kid, I was strangely driven. <laughs> and like from the age of about seven, I wanted to do law. I picked all my subjects at school with the view to doing the right A-levels, with the view to doing the right degree, to getting to, you know, like, it was kind of very much on the set path that I wanted to do. That was the plan. I didn't want my illness to have stopped me getting what I wanted. And so for a long time, I did keep trying to do that. I went to university and went to law school and I got a job up in the city, a training contract with a law firm, which is kind of my dream job. I'd had three or four start dates and hadn't made any of them because I'd not funny. <laughs> I'd been in hospital on every single date and I had to keep phoning in and going, mm, poorly again. It wasn't until I was over 30 that I had to make a decision to let go of something that had been a dream since I was about seven. I was diagnosed at the beginning of 2011, but it was a type of cancer that's very slow growing and can be monitored, and I'm still living with. And I've had the time to get my head round the whole idea of cancer, and that it actually is part of me, that it's my body, and that it's not something that's outside, and it's my body going wrong, and that's really important to me. My previous partner, James, contracted HIV. I mean, talking back in the 90s, you know, people are very frightened still. The way he dealt with his diagnosis, he actually made a, his life to get involved. He did a lot of work with gay men fighting AIDS. And it was that attitude about getting involved, about using something that was actually a life-changing thing, to actually try and do something really positive with it. the way that they deal with illness and deal with possible shortened lifespan is how they can get their head around it. I'm living my life at the moment and uh, trying to manage the problem prostate, which is the major problem. My lung, lung is slightly cancerous. That is for prostate, metformin for type 2 diabetes, codeine. I'm doing all what I can to manage and try to forget. I got to be out and about, you know. Medication is not going to do this on his own. Usually I go to hospital by myself. I don't take the kids with me, you know, and they don't really want to see me get needles and stuff like that. And sometimes you go there and you don't know what you're going to hear. You don't know the news that you're going to get. So I've gone to see the oncologist and then I had the scan done and then he was like, yeah, Mr. Daddy, I suggest you go away and live your life. Oh, thanks, mate.
My weeks really vary because my health is still really unpredictable. I've had to learn to use the time when I can't be out and about and doing things. I can work out how well I am depending on what I can do. If I can still play the piano, then it's a, I'm a bit unwell but not that bad. And I have a whole spectrum of things that I can do at home that will determine how well I am on that day. so many ways in which it can support or distract and I really consciously tried to be a lot more proactive in doing that and going out and see music and eat crazy food and I think that is definitely me sort of using where I live in the city to make me feel like I'm a bit more in control of what's happening. So in spite of my illness I could do the things that I like to do and I'm not sure that there are many places where it would be as easy to do that. You don't know what happened tomorrow. If you change your lifestyle and become active, no matter what you do, job done. But if you, you do a bit more, that even better. I um, run a prostate cancer support group um, for gay and bisexual men. I would never have marched giving out leaflets and going up and speaking to people in the crowd, which I would have never have thought that I would have been capable of. But it's sort of something that, you know, if it can just make a difference to one or two people, that's great. Thank you. I just thought to myself, you know what, fuck you, doctor, and fuck you, cancer. I am going to make five years. Once I just thought about my kids and I thought, they're too little. Like, if I go now, how are they going to know me? How are they going to know, like, the things that I would have liked them to learn and stuff like that? And just that thought alone was enough for me to say, you know what, like, I'm going to do it. To Shanae, I want you to know I love you so much and though we don't always seem to agree on things, I still love the person you are. You have a strong mind and stand up for what you believe and I admire that so much about you. I decided instead of sitting on the couch and uh, on the bed just watching TV, I was getting very lazy. So I decided to do something for the community which I'm living in. Whenever they need me, it's so 24 hours. I never switch off my phone. BC stands for blood cancer and BT, uh, brain tumor. And uh, this one is uh, Shabir. Uh, he's, uh, he got type 2 diabetes and brain cancer as well. So B, C, D2, they tell me what problem they have. Uh, yes, yeah, sometime later on I will uh, come and see you, okay? Okay, thank you. Okay, bye. Bye-bye, bye. bye, -bye. bye. She's the one who got the uh, brain tumor and also breast cancer. Going through the whole cancer thing myself, I was looking around for support for my kids and there really wasn't any. And I noticed that they didn't want to talk to anyone about it, so they didn't tell any of their friends. They just kept it all inside. So I realised that it would be good to have a place where the kids would be able to go and not necessarily have to talk about anything, but just to know that they're not the only kids that are going through that. Thank you.
And are you able to talk to other people apart from here, but other people, friends about it? There are some ways of looking at cancer that are now being more holistic. And the whole thing about how cancer, you know, even from a medical point of view, they're treating a disease. It should be treating the person, treating the medical, the emotional, the intellectual, and the spiritual side of someone. I always thought that I'd really want to be in a 9-to-5 job, doing something high-powered in the city. But actually, I really like the fact I can choose what I do. And actually, as someone who's been a patient for a long time, I go and talk to other patients to see how their experiences of health services are. And also, I do voluntary work. They call me an expert by experience. We're talking about how people are involved in their care and thinking about the different levels of involvement that we've had in our experiences and how that could be improved. What I've realised is actually my illness informs so much of how I think now and my perspective on things and what I want out of life that kind of coming to some acceptance that it's part of me as opposed to wanting to distance myself from it. I talked a lot to people who had that exact, exact same thing and it's really spurred me on to kind of get more involved. It makes you feel that that experience can be used for some good at least. Uh, Derek, I got uh, quite a lot of concern because uh, he loves his food and he got the high blood pressure and uh, his weight is, I think, over 22 uh, stones. Right, so how are you keeping? I'm keeping all right at the moment. You all right? This is the pack uh, for the food, you know, it will help oh, you yeah. how you choose your food. And, uh, if they have more information regarding their self, and what's happening to them. I think they are better prepared to see the doctor, GP, because GP is the first line of action. Me, just to give them information, feed them with the information they need. He can come any time he wants. We won't have Let's him come all the time to what he is close. going. We are really close. Yeah, yeah, he keeps me, keeps me active and keeps me stopped me being down. So Harry keeps me going because he was fed up doing nothing. That's Harry for you. Well done, Jay. I can get up yes, on this chair. Yes, you can. Is that chair? I'm really glad about that. One is a great person that I've ever met. Okay. He's a great friend of ours, and he'll do anything for us. Today is our annual summer family fun day. We do them every year. They're merely to raise awareness of what we do and to raise money to help us to support the families that are living with cancer and children who are bereaved from parents. Okay, make some noise for under eights. All the people that are here today are volunteers. If you don't ask, you don't get. You have to go to all of these different organisations, you go online and you find them. There's so much people that are willing to help. Now, people are actually coming to us, can we do anything for you? What we do every year, in remembrance of people that we've lost, we have a balloon release. So the idea of it is everybody who's lost someone, they write a label with a message to their loved one and then we set the balloons off at the end of the day. But I remember those people and for me it kind of like, it makes it more important for me to make my life count. I said, I'm not a doctor, don't call me doctor. I am doing my job as a human being, you know. No, I got enough time in my hand. Because you got to make your life good for you. And to make your life good for you, you got to do good things for the others. You do for yourself because it's you. 
But if you do these things for the others who are in problem, who are suffering with the cancer, with the diabetes, by thinking, by educating yourself, by managing, I think it's easy. It should be easy. It's not much time you lose. The more you know about it, the more you will ask for it. And I'm sure that will help you. And I'm does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I get out of London and the people, diagnosis actually has really positive things that come out of it. Lovely speaking to you. <laughs> you take care. I think because I've been quite involved recently in talking to lots of other people who've gone through similar experiences, I'm very focused on getting work again and relationships and explaining to people you're in relationships with what happened. <laughs> I'm just getting ready to get my results of all the tests that I've been having. This is a big time for me because it's the five year mark. Nicola Dady, please. I was told that it was highly unlikely I was going to make it to five years. I'm OK. The results of today are going to really impact my life. I saw you, was it about six months ago yeah. for a checkup then? If it's still there, I just keep on doing what I'm doing. Like, I've gone through it once, so I try and use the same strategy to get through it again. So basically, um, I've been given the all clear. Sorry, I do hugs. <laughs> Sorry. I'm no longer in remission and I'm now cancer free. It's almost like starting again. I also feel a little bit sad as well, if I'm honest, for the people that I've met along the journey that haven't made it. But that is actually a real feeling of guilt. I don't know why you get it, but you do. They told me five years ago that there's an 80% chance I'm not going to be here today. And I'm here five years later. And I'm not just here, but I'm doing all of this stuff. It's an amazing feeling, amazing. It's really overwhelming though, like sometimes I just stand back and look and I'm like, wow, I've done this, like, I did this. Stop Anything? looking at me like that. <laughs> there you are, shake some bum and, you know, and uh, enjoy yourself, that's life. The guys that I've met at the group actually sort of changes your life and I feel like my life has been changed. Now it's like living rather than surviving. Finding meaning in your life when you can't do what you want. Or accepting, just having an acceptance over the fact that your life is very different to how you thought it might be.